Our next talk about visual narratives, sexual stigma, and physician notes from American Eugenics Records features three speakers who will be coming on stage now to share on this, again, challenging topic, but something important for us to talk about and recognize. Jane Huang, a third year studying quantitative social science, digital arts at Dartmouth College, is passionate about leveraging systems thinking with empathy to solve societal challenges. She is a coder, artist, and passionate advocate for equitable access to mental health care. Our second speaker, Dr. Carly Bobak, PhD, is a biomedical informatics scientist at Dartmouth College's Information Technology and Consulting Department, where she enhances faculty research through data science support and leads workshops in programming, data visualization, and AI. As an instructor in the QBS program, she leverages her expertise in quantitative biomedical sciences to teach courses like data wrangling, contributing significantly to the intersection of data science and healthcare research. Finally, Jacqueline Wiernemont is a distinguished chair of digital humanities and social engagement and an associate professor of film and media studies at Dartmouth College. She is also a co-director of the Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaborative and runs the Digital Justice Lab at Dartmouth. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our wonderful speakers and they will help you understand the mounting piles of paper appearing on the stage. All right, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you to our volunteers who are um, helping us here. Um, thank you also to the staff um, who are keeping our tech running and our bodies fueled. Um, we really appreciate it. But before we dive in, I wanna make a few comments um, about our presentation. Um, we are talking about human rights violations in the past. We are talking, we are doing historical and quantitative analysis of sterilization recommendations from the uh, early, the first half of the 20th century here in the United States. We have two slides uh, in which you will see quotes where the language is demeaning, racializing, sexualizing, and othering. Um, we are also talking in aggregate about this kind of language, right? Language that is pathologizing both physical and mental disability. Um, the language will also, um, that we're talking about, pathologizes queerness and sexuality. And it only recognizes binary sex and it conflates gender and sex. There is no recognition in our records, um, right, of non-binary or trans identity. And while we are constrained by what the records argue, we also want to emphasize that just because these records see people, <laughs> it's kind of awesome, see people in a particular way, it doesn't mean that it's true. Queer, trans, non-binary people have always existed, including in the period that we are covering. If you would like to step away at any time, please feel free to do so. We care more about you taking care of yourselves. We'll be happy to talk about this if you want to engage later. Um, I also want to apologize that we were um, not prepared to do a, like a full um, articulation, a full narrative description of some of the historical photographs that we have. Um, that's our mistake. Uh, and I'm happy to provide a, a new PowerPoint slide that has those narrative descriptions in it. Okay, so you may know this gentleman up here. Uh, anybody know who this is? Oh, it's rad, you don't know. Great, well, you do, but you don't. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why you should forget him after we get done with this, right? <laughs> This is Francis Galton. Uh, Francis Galton is often quoted with uh, this particular maxim, whenever you can count. Um, he also, he's a, a person who sort of inaugurates um, statistical uh, behavioral analyses of human populations and human communities. Um, he's really big in the statistical genomics um, sort of intellectual trajectory. Um, and he loves a data visualization, right? So statistics are full of beauty and interest. And here he's thinking not just of them in a table, but um, as a biz. And their power of dealing with complicated phenomena is extraordinary. Uh, if you want to go ahead and click. Um, I'm going to read you this other quote from Francis Galton. It would be no great burden to a society, including many members who had eugenics at heart, to initiate and to preserve a large collection of such records for the use of statistical students. Now, uh, one of the implications here that I'm, I'm, we're making for you 
is that data visualization, data science, and eugenics have a very tightly linked history, right? And that we need to be responsible and responsive to that history. Um, one of the implications in, the, in this linked history um, that we were talking about when Eli was talking uh, on Wednesday, right, is that maybe some historical data might already be evil, right? Um, you know, it might not be us needing to do evil with historical data. It might be that it's already evil. And as we were listening to the talk, um, to Eli talk, Carly noted that maybe data by villains needs data villainy, um, which is, I think, you know, kind of a humorous way of highlighting the importance of the rhetorical choices we make with our data. But also, right, we want to stress that data and data visualization is always about power and interpretation. Data creators um, are often, especially historical ones, but I think always, right, trying to shape or limit how we see what we as future readers could read in the data, how we could understand our historical communities. So now eugenics, for those of you who don't know, um, is a, a sort of ideology, a practice, a theory um, of, that social control can be used to improve the racial qualities of future generations. And in roughly the first half of the 20th century, American institutions, superintendents, and physicians sterilized at least 60,000 people, right? Um, that is the equivalent to 56 of these rooms filled to capacity. And part of what we wanted to do, we really wanted to bring, um, especially having seen this stage, some more physical, visceral qualities to our talk. These are, I'm gonna to talk to uh, you in a minute about the 22,511 records that make up our data set. But this is 22,511 pieces of paper, right? And I want you to put those 22,511 pieces of paper up against what it would mean to have 46 of these rooms full of people, right? Paperwork, people very different things. Um, some of these people who were sterilized, right, were mothers experiencing postpartum depression, uh, people who had epilepsy, people who had diabetes, people who had experienced sexual or war trauma. I think in many ways, people like us and many of us in the communities of which we are part. And these records, you see them behind me, um, each sterilization recommendation was roughly a single page. Um, it was sometimes typed up um, you know, sort of like by hand as the one on my left, um, or my right, actually, maybe your left. And later we ended up with uh, short forms that were kind of fill in the blank forms, but a single page to recommend that someone lose their reproductive freedom. That's it, right? Um, using a formulation that I'm borrowing from Jared Thorpe, who is obviously here with us, even if not here with us, um, we constantly ask ourselves in this project what to do, or what do the data want us to do? How do the data want us to see the people? And how might we tell the story otherwise? How do we become bad students of Galton? I, quite frankly, do not want to be the future that Galton dreamed of, right? And I want us all to tell a different story. So Alexander Mina Stern stumbled on these records in an abandoned hospital, in an abandoned and forgotten about filing cabinet where they had been photographed, right? Um, and that was how we got access to this history. Prior to Stern finding these records, we didn't have confirmation. Um, we didn't have any materials. Um, and in many states, these records have either been destroyed or they're hidden behind um, privacy protection laws, usually HIPAA, although I can talk to you at great length about why they don't apply here. Um, our larger uh, project is collaborating with people who have records from North Carolina, Michigan, Iowa, Utah, and more. 32 of the 50 states in the US had eugenics laws, but every state made their own records and their own practices. And so from a data standpoint, this is like some wild data. It is highly irregular. Right? Um, it is very difficult to structure, very difficult to work with across time and space. So anytime that you have any kind of data, it comes with baggage. Because all data, like Jackie was saying, is shaped in some way by someone and it comes from somewhere. So as a consequence, objective data is impossible. And for us, an essential part of positive disruption in data visualization is incorporating principles of data feminism, such as acknowledging that data is never neutral or objective. As with anything that is not neutral or objective, all data wants us to think in a certain way. And that way is a product of the processes, systems, and people that shaped and built the data. So this data, let's think about that. 
This data wants us to think about the sterilization records as representations of patients, as evidenced by these quotes you can see up here that are pulled directly from individual sterilization recommendations. But in reality, these records are a reflection of the harmful ideologies of the superintendents at each medical institution who wrote these recommendations, who built and catalyzed this system of injustice. So instead of thinking the way the data wants us to think, the way the superintendents want us to think, let's think the opposite way. But what does that mean? First, that means acknowledging that the data tells us very little about each patient and instead a whole lot about the people who wrote the recommendations. So we've established we are reading these records for what they say about who wrote them, not about who they were written about. One of our goals is to use the study of these records not to repeat the harms experienced by people who were recommended for sterilization, but rather to better understand who we need to hold accountable for past injustice and how we can avoid repeating our history. So here we have some timelines that highlight 17 of the most powerful and destructive leaders of California's eugenic sterilization movement. For example, you can see on the board that bottom line is for Fred Butler. Fred Butler was arguably the most influential superintendent in, the, in California's eugenic sterilization movement. He worked at Sonoma Hospital from about 1915 to 1950. That spans almost the entire time that eugenic sterilization was taking place in California. So he was responsible for the recommendation of over 5,000 people for sterilization. So you can see that impact of one person on 5,000 people. And you see that connection, that power, and that's kind of what we're exploring here. While Butler made more recommendations than anyone else in California, all of these 17 men on this graph suggested that many, many people be sterilized. This includes Webster, Joyce, Smith, and Clark, who each recommended more than 1,000 people be sterilized. Please note the size legend should say 1,000 and under, not just 1,000. So many different forms of bigotry and discrimination fueled eugenic sterilization in California. Racism, ageism, sexism, homophobia. Today we're gonna focus on how gender-based sexual stigma was a part of how particular people perceived and wrote about people in their care. It's important for us to connect these stigmas not to the patients, but rather to the superintendents. Here we note we're constrained, as Jackie mentioned earlier, by the language used by superintendents. All of these forms rely on a very strict binary language about sex and conflate gender with sex. We're not making any claims about the sex or gender identity of any of the people discussed in these forms, which we don't have access to at this time. So these line graphs that you're gonna see are built from a subset of 2004 cases records that included sex stigma. This subset of over 2,000 cases was created by filtering the entire California data set for any records that had any sexual delinquency checkboxes marked or included the written notes, in the written notes, one or more words from a set of phrases related to sex stigma that were predefined manually. So the lines here represent the total, the male, and the female number of cases within each subset per superintendent. So you can see wires here use sex stigma language in his recommendations more often for patients who are labeled female. And a similar story here is clear for Joyce and Butler, though at different scales. A similar story is clear here that when using, when for Butler, Joyce, and Wires, language that involved sexual stigma had a bend towards patients labeled female. However, the opposite case is true for Clark and Webster, two of our other superintendents. For Clark and Webster, they recommended sterilization on the basis of sex stigma for more patients labeled male than patients labeled female. And as we'll see in a minute, there's a clear difference in the language of sex stigma used depending on whether these superintendents were talking about patients they considered men or women. So now, we've established first who the bad actors are, superintendents, and also established not only does sex stigma exist within these sterilization records, it's also manifesting in gendered ways that vary across leadership. Turning narratives into data is complicated, uh, especially on a large scale. Uh, we can and have attempted to label and categorize these individual records. However, as someone who has been trained as a statistician, 
I can tell you that every time we simplify our data, we experience something called information loss. And when we are talking about data being about data recorders, it is also important to consider the data that is actually embedded in the language that they are using. Now, I am sure many of you are familiar with natural language processing or text analysis. And if you weren't before this conference, you heard a little bit about it yesterday. Uh, in order to study the language of eugenic superintendents, uh, we used pre-trained text embeddings similar to those that power ChatGPT um, that would allow a computer to understand the semantics of sterilizers and allow us to reveal patterns in this language. The text you are seeing on this slide is a two-dimensional projection plot, wherein age is being shown along our x-axis, and along this diagonal dimension, we have a uh, axis representing sex, such that records that are above this diagonal, um, words in records above this diagonal seem to occur more often for female records, and words below were more often associated with records about male patients. This allows us to immediately see different patterns in the language. Young men have a lot of language about sex, but also words like colored and gang and labor. And in contrast, young women have language that is largely about their relationships to other people. We see words like men and husband and offspring. As women get older, this language shifts and it becomes a lot more about the documentation of their clinical history. As male patients got a little older, their language shifted a lot more towards criminal and delinquent behavior with words like bad, menace, attempted, and tendencies appearing. When we come all the way to the end of this plot, uh, we see a lot of language um, that is less of a gender divide, but is really more about feelings of persecution and delusion and actually describing mental health symptomology appearing for our older adults. And we can also train topic models, wherein a machine learning algorithm searches for common trends across all of our records uh, and comes up with some finite list of topics that appear in them. Uh, we can then sort each record into the topic they are most matched with from those records. In this figure, we are showing our top super attendance along the x-axis and the percentage of records assigned to a particular topic across our y-axis. In this case, our topic is illegitimacy, which refers both to patients having illegitimate children or having been what was considered an illegitimate child themselves. Here, every time you see the word illegitimate written once, that is one record that was primarily about illegitimacy. Um, we can immediately identify here that Joyce, Webster, and Butler started developing a vernacular that used illegitimacy as a primary means of justifying sterilization. What won't surprise you is that this was only present in female records. Similarly, records primarily discussing delinquency and immorality are seen primarily for female patients, with 6.5% of all of our records about female patients being sorted into these topics, and it was less than 1% of our male records being sorted this way. Uh, like illegitimacy, Butler and Joyce are both critical offenders of language on delinquency and immorality being used to describe our patients. All right, so let's take a closer look at Joyce. Joyce was a superintendent at Pacific Colony for over two decades and was a celebrated leader, as you can see in this newspaper clipping. Joyce applied sex stigma on the basis of a patient's recorded sex in a particular way that is illustrated in these word clouds. And these word clouds are made from words and phrases made directly from the language used in the records. So what I mean by this is that Joyce's recommendations for patients labeled female often labeled these individuals as sexually delinquent and having be a behavior that was said to be beyond control of their family or their parents. Phrases such as illegitimate child, gonorrhea, and Wasserman, which is the name of a test for syphilis, were very common in these records. While for male patients, they were usually labeled as sex problems or sexually perverted. Phrases such as exhibitionism and peeping Tom were very common in these records. From this, we can see a very clear difference in the kinds of sexually stigmatizing language used by Joyce. And we can infer that he was more concerned about female patients having STIs and children out of wedlock. And for male patients, he was more focused on issues of sexual behavior. 
Joyce's records also spent a lot of time focused on patients or female patients being described as being out of control or requiring more supervision than they were already receiving at home. Um, this, like illegitimacy, was happening uh, at a rate that's much, much more present in records about female patients than male patients. And then while illegitimacy, delinquency, immorality, and control are language that are largely unique to female patient records, language around perversion is nearly exclusively used in records on male patients. Now, all of this is happening in a contemporary moment in which peeping toms um, were literally part of like public activity, right? This is a picture from the 1936 Pacific International Fair. Could you click again for me? These peeping toms are looking in at an established nudist colony, right? This was known as the Zorro nudist colony, and it was put in place in San Diego specifically for an international exhibition. So not everyone has a problem with exhibitionism, nudity, and peeping toms, but that is the language that our uh, superintendents are using for sterilization recommendation. Now, one of our goals today, uh, right, is to help you see that these are people, right? The people in this picture are literally inmates who were at Pacific Colony at the time that Joyce was doing uh, his sterilization work. Um, on the other side, right, is the paperwork. Joyce's goal was to reduce these people into paperwork, right? He wanted us to see that they merited losing their re reproductive freedom. Go ahead. Um, and here I'm just, this is an overlay of the same thing that Carly and uh, Jane have been talking about, right? But as good students of Galton or good students of Joyce, right? What they want us to do is pay attention to these bubbles, right? To erase the people behind the picture. Go ahead. Um, and to think of these people in terms of how we can visualize it rather than as people. Go ahead. Um, right? So Joyce looked at a group like this. This is a group of immigrants um, newly uh, come to the United States. We're being held in a facility um, at the contemporary moment. And Joyce says, here, what I see is piles and piles of paperwork, right? And what I want you all to see, what Joyce wanted us all to see, right, was instead this, right? That these are delinquent, perverted, truant children who engage in sex and exhibitionism, right? He wanted to erase from us the face of these people. These are some of the survivors, although I want to note that Rosie Swar did not survive her sterilization procedure. She died on the table at the age of 16, right? Mary Alice and Minnie Lee Ralph, Charles Holt, Elaine Reddick, Jamie Coleman, these are all people who are still alive, who survived their sterilization. They're among the few, um, right? As age goes along, people are passing away. So I would encourage us to be bad students of Galton. Go ahead. So it's really essential to think about the limitations and affordances of every data set. And foundational to all of this is that principle of data feminism that we've been talking about. Data is never objective and neutral. It is a product of those who shaped it, produced it, and even presented it. So if the data wanted us to think about patients one way, how can we tell this story differently from now on? First, as we've done so today, be discerning. And second, we lean into the emotion but we do so responsibly because this allows us to engage our empathy. We must be careful with how we lean into emotion. Data visualization should not traumatize an audience. Discomfort is often essential, yes, but it must be paired with care from those sharing the data with the audience. So I encourage all of you to think and engage in ways to care for yourself and those around you when interacting with difficult data such as this. Finally, we remember that this injustice is not that far from us. The danger of this history being repeated is very present. Many survivors of eugenic sterilization are still alive. You know, as time goes on, as Jackie said, there's not so many, but you know, these are people with real lives who are still suffering to this day because of the consequences of this systemic injustice. And in some circles, there is resurgence of these ideas. However, why isn't this story more widely known? Even the way this data was found in an abandoned building speaks to the way this story is actively and intentionally being erased by the perpetrators. It is our job to use responsible engagement of emotion paired with care 
compassionate and innovative data viz, and radical accountability to create the positive disruption that is so important to everything we've been talking about here at Outliers and is essential to creating a more just world. wants to dismantle the literal ID tower that was made um, by eugenic records, right? These men created their careers, including at places like Stanford, by making these records and then running around sharing this information. If you'd like to come deconstruct this ID tower, you are more than welcome to. Thank you. Let's take a, another big round of applause for our presenters. Thank you so much. So we have a few minutes for questions and I see a line already forming. Um, I want to just recognize what a tremendous kind of piece of work that is that you all have taken on yourselves in terms of diving into these records and this history and thank you so much for presenting them here today. To our questions up at the mic and I'll be watching for virtual questions from Zane who I think is holding our virtual questions where I'm sure there's also a lot of conversation happening. Hello, thank you so much, that was awesome. Uh, so, um, I see this reflected in a lot of different things as well. Uh, historically speaking, for example, contraceptive went through something very similar at the expense of the Latin community. So developing it for women because women are not acknowledged of the pain that they have. And then it took us way more and still does to design contraceptive for men because men uh, were doing it in a moment where we recognize their pain and the, the second, what do you call it? Uh, when you have like a response to the medicine. Secondary. Side effect, thank you, yeah. So uh, I wanted to know if you have a good example on things, like positive things that you see on uh, us understanding and recognizing the bad side or the evil side of data uh, in, in any kind of way uh, that can help us either in like, clinical trials or other things in health in general that you could talk about. Because I know that bad examples exist a ton, but like, <laughs> what are the good ones maybe that we can rely on and use as a framework? Yeah, May I? I, um, I have a couple, okay. um, but you can hop in too because you more, work more in the medical side. So I'll just say real quickly on this, um, the work that the larger sterilization and social justice lab um, is doing um, has resulted in um, reparations bills being passed in North Carolina and California, um, right? So that is, um, I think, a positive development. I will also mention um, Catherine D'Ignazio, whose name has also been with us today. Um, did some work on um, breast pumps, right? And uh, feminist approaches to breast pumps. So I think those are a couple. Carly, you had? Yeah, and one of my favorite studies, and I will link this in the Slack later for anyone who is interested, um, came out a couple years ago um, with a group who was looking at x-rays of knees um, for patients who needed um, knee surgery. And they were trying to develop a deep learning algorithm to help them diagnose that properly. Um, and they initially used the way physicians were classifying uh, these knee injuries as their outcome measure and their deep learning algorithm was failing. Uh, eventually they had the idea of changing instead of using how patients or physicians were labeling patients, using patients self-reported pain measures as their outcome. And that actually revealed that while physicians um, had been underrating how much pain African-American patients were in, um, they were experiencing a different type of knee injury that the physicians and the radiographers were unaware of that the deep learning algorithm was able to detect once it knew that that needed to be taken seriously. And so I would really encourage anybody who's working in the medical space to think about not just our physicians as stakeholders, but think about the patients and the other people they are working with because they have critical pieces of data that actually lead to really, really important clinical outcomes. Um, and I will link that around later. Okay. okay. But there's an app. Now you mentioned it. I remember that there is an app. I don't know if you've seen it that actually helps you qualify and classify the type even of pain that you're feeling. And it's a uh, super well designed UI and UI. So yeah, I can also uh, search for that. And thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Over to our virtual audience. Zane, do we have a question from our virtual attendees? Yes. I actually want to share first um, a comment by Heather Bree. Wow, it's like using the narrative concept of the unreliable narrator in data analysis. And that's a really cool observation. Um, and then we do have a question from Patricia. Anyone know where we can learn more about this research and the methods behind it? 
So for those who might be online, uh, a question from Patricia about the, learning more about this research and the methods behind it if someone wants to know more about the work you all are doing. Yeah, uh, so you can look up the Social Justice and Sterilization Lab, um, which is currently housed uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles, um, but is actually a collaboration across five different institutions. Um, I will also say that we will be happy to put up on the Digital Humanities and Social Engagement Cluster at Dartmouth's website um, about our work, including the slides, et cetera. Um, and this summer, we will be launching a um, contextual archive built out of this project that will incorporate this and many, many more um, pieces of work that we've done on this project. Fantastic. Next question. Hi there. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for such um, a you know, fantastic presentation. And you know, it's very clear as an, from an audience perspective that this has been done with the utmost respect and sensitivity. Um, so I, I thank you for that. Uh, my question was kind of related to modeling the data and using natural language processing techniques. So, uh, you know, assumedly with such uh, unstructured data, so much variability, uh, a lot of this data needs to be modeled, and then those models need a lot of parameters to train and, you know, uh, dial in what needs to be found in the data. So how do you um, kind of reconcile the need to fit the data into some kind of model, which will need parameters and training, and then, um, you know, at the end of the day, some data will be kind of like sliced away from the model. How do you reconcile the need to fit the data into a model, but then knowing that some of that data might be lost, and again, pairing that with not wanting to lose too much information, given these are all very uh, you know, individual and very uh, important stories per person. Yeah, uh, and hello, I'm the data modeler. Um, <laughs> one of my uh, favorite quotes, and I tell this to my students all the time, is that all models are bad, but some are useful. Um, that is also really true in this case, and that is also part of the reason why we wanted to, as shocking as it was to show you some of the direct quotes from these records, show you things in context and then show you the larger patterns that models can learn from them. These two things feed each other. They are both critical pieces of the narrative, and I have spent a lot of time reading these records. I would prefer not to read all 22,000 of them if I can help it, um, but we are making sure to take those steps that while we look for the quantitative things that make our models look happy and that all the computer scientists want to see, we're making sure that we can actually map that back to the real stories that are present to the records and really protecting that narrative as well. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that as, you know, I learned from Jackie and Carly, and I'm so blessed to have these two amazing women as my mentors and, and to learn from them and just be in that. Um, I kind of get to learn more in the middle where it's like I get to learn some of the more like data modeling side and then also just getting dirty with the data. You know what I mean? Like just getting into it and reading everything. So you can see some of the, some of the stuff we built. It's not this like super high tech model you know like we took a lot of use from just sitting and breaking all of the notes down into word clouds and then just we printed out so many word clouds and we just redid them and redid them and we tried them with phrases and we tried them with like two words and three words and like that's not the exciting side of it but it's every data set like what we were saying you know every data set has limitations and affordances and part of that you don't know going into it like what that is. So sometimes you just have to read things until you figure out, yeah, this is what's going to work for it. And, you know, we kind of approached it two ways when it came to understanding, you know, we, we definitely had a lot of exploration and debate about, okay, what, how do we quantify or qualify what is a record that indicates sex stigma, right? Because that's like a really broad, complicated thing. And, you know, my mind immediately went to, you know, because I'm thinking big and I'm like a student and I want to learn. I'm like, we should train a model like custom to like the words that we want. And, you know, that would be amazing. And that would be a cool thing to explore. But like, you know, that's, that's definitely a tough, challenging thing that takes time. So what we ended up doing is I just read through a lot of records and then I just picked out words and we ended up filtering just through like literally just like string detection, which is not super like, you know, maybe as advanced or, or whatnot, but it works and it's, it's authentic to the data and it's telling the story and that's what's most important. It was actually better, I think, than using Llama, yeah. Yeah. which we also did. Yeah. 
Well, I know that there are more questions lined up at the mic, but we are at time for this section. So I would ask that people go ahead and take their questions over to the Slack channel, um, come and have a conversation with our presenters as we move into the lunch break and find some time to really sit with some of these ideas. I think there's a lot there that, while this may seem abstract and divorced from some of the work we all do, thinking about the care we can take with data and information, especially in the ways it represents people, and thinking back to this pile of paper representing how many auditorium 46? 46 of these auditoriums to capacity. 46 of these auditoriums to capacity, and thinking about that translation of people and numbers is so important. So one more round of applause for our speakers.